and welcome one of our dearest friends who's a wonderful minister. She and her husband have a great church in New Jersey. She travels around the world ministering on deliverance. Welcome Trisha Roselli. Amen. Hallelujah. It's so good to be here. Thank you, Chuck, for the invitation and Pam and all the team here. I'm really honored to be here. I'm really excited about this meeting because had it not been for Jesus on my side, I don't know that I'd be alive right now. And, and you know, the Lord is getting us ready. These meetings are so important because he's raising up a remnant army. He's raising up an army that knows who they are and are willing to take a stand for what's right and decree that thing and cause a shift. And that's why we need to know about deliverance. That's why we need to know about who we are and how to continually to learn how to walk in our freedom. And um, so one of the scriptures that the Lord uh, has, has, has had me meditate on is in Joel chapter 3, 1. And it says, for behold, in those days and at that time, I shall reverse captivity and restore fortunes. And that's what the Lord is preparing us for. He is reversing the curses that have been in our lives. And he is restoring your fortunes. Do you believe that? He is reversing our curses and restoring our fortunes. Now, the captivity that I had experienced in my life, I never thought I could get free from. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. I was in a pit. I was in a place of, of total defeat. And I really didn't want to have anything to do with the Lord. My father was, um, you know, we were raised Catholic and never really went to church or only on holidays. Didn't really understand anything about God. We thought we were the church but never read the Bible. <laughs> and, um, but my father had an encounter with the Lord. And my father started to minister to us about Jesus. And um, my father had gotten ill. He had died uh, at an early age from asbestos um, from the company he worked for. And there was just a lot of issues that took place with that. And um, right before my dad died, he grabbed my hand. And he said to me, God's going to use you. And, and he started to prophesy over me, and I was crying, and I was trying to pull my hand away from him, and I ran, and I never saw him again. Three days later, he died. So with that, I decided I didn't want any part of God. And I said, if that's the God you serve, I don't want any part of him. So I went in my room, and I knelt down, and I said to God, you I hate. And I said, but Satan, I'd rather serve you, and I welcome you into my life. Now, how many of you know that's pretty stupid? <laughs> that's what I did. So you can imagine from that point on, my life spiraled. Do you think I had a problem beforehand? Well, he's not a good God. He's not a good God. We serve the great God, a God of the, the great I am who's good, who loves us, and who's merciful forever. So I went into a very bad place. I wasn't exactly a model citizen. I, 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 because of all the anger, and there was a lot of stuff that took place in my life, like many of you, I, I was very rebellious. And um, I wasn't listening to you. I didn't care who you were. I wasn't listening to you, which how many of you know that's stupid. So we're going to break. We're going to break and come out of agreement and alignment with rebellion. And... Um, so what happened was I worked for the airlines and a lot of people were ministering to me about Jesus and I really, you know, I was like, speak to the hand. I don't want to, I don't want to hear about him. I'm an atheist. But I was listening. I was watching. I wanted to see if they had something that I was craving for. I wanted, I wanted something because I thought more about dying than I did about living. I did not have hope for anything. And I understand suicide and the severity of that and how serious it is. I thought more, I tried. I wanted to die. I did not want to live. And as they started to talk to me about the Lord, I listened, gave them a hard time, but I listened. And there was a day that I, I was about to have a nervous breakdown. My mother had a nervous breakdown. My sisters got divorced. I mean, everything that, that could have gone wrong went wrong after my dad died. And... Um, I thought, well, what do I have to lose? And I prayed, you know, and at that time when I worked for the airlines, everybody, not everybody, pretty much all of us were partying, getting high, and, 
and I had an issue with cocaine. And I prayed. The woman who always ministered to me was preaching. She would always say to uh, preach uh, John 10, 10, the thief comes, but the seal kill and destroy. But I've come to give you life more abundantly. Well, I can assure you I didn't have an abundant life. And I prayed, and I said, God, I'm gonna, I'm, if you're real, I'm going to give you one year. And I'm going to see what you can do for me. And if it doesn't work out, I'm going back to my old lifestyle. I said, but don't take my abundant life as cocaine. And that's my desire. Now, why I say that is how God is so merciful. You know, when Chad shared his testimony about how God, you know, he rescued Chad. He went after him. God didn't care. He met me where I was at. I mean, he probably wanted to smack me. But he met me where I was at where I was just so belligerent with my attitude. I just had no hope, and I said, I'll give you one year. Now, I didn't know where Born Again's went to church. <laughs> I never heard of Born Again. So I just knew that, well, I said, well, I'll read the Bible. And people bought me a Bible. I didn't attend service. I didn't attend church. I actually backslid when I got to church. But anyway, that's a separate story. But when I, when I, when I started to read the Bible, I started to believe the Word of God. And I devoured the word. Amen. I mean, I devoured the word. And I started to read it. And I would look at people and say, well, this book says that if I pray for you, you'll get healed. And I would say, come on, let's just pray. And I would pray for people. And we started to have revival in the airlines. People started to get healed. They, I saw demons on people. I had no grit for any of this. People would fall out under the power of the Lord. I thought they passed out. So I didn't know. I never saw anything like this. So God started really moving. And, and, and it was for like about a good two years. I did not attend a church, but, but I devoured the word. And the Lord started to really break through in my life. And, you know, in, in the book of Romans uh, chapter 12, and, I'm, and I know Chuck read it the other day, but I want to read it again out of the Amplified. And I think that's what he read it out of. And it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourself set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, um, intelligent act of worship. Don't be conformed to the world any longer with its super superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed. See, it's a process as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focus on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourself what the will of God is and that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan. So God wanted me to change from one form into another. He wanted to renovate. That's what that word renew means, to renovate my life, renovate my mindsets. Now, I had no clue how to do this. I didn't know that God wants to supernaturally reverse things in my life. But I, I yielded to the Lord because I was so desperate. I didn't care if I lived or died. I said, God, if you're real, if you can do this, if you can shift my life and cause deliverance to take place, then I'm in. Because I can't go on any longer. That's why these meetings are so important. Curses are real. Deliverance is real. I thank God for the blood of Jesus that set me free because I promise you I would not be alive right now. And so God, it, he met me where I was at. But one of the things that happened because of, of where I, you know, just my f lifestyle and, and, and family issues, you know, a lot of curses, word curses were spoken over me. And then I had my own self-imposed word curses that I spoke over myself. And that's what I have found that has caused the body to stay in a place of defeat. Because we have embraced the whispers, we have embraced the lies of the enemy, and we have exalted his word over what the word of God says. And so we can't move forward unless we get a revelation of the word, unless we meditate on the word. The Lord spoke to me. I had a vision a couple years ago. We were in a prayer meeting, and the angels came in, and they had swords, and they were piercing people's abdomens, and they said, the famine of the word is over. And I'm decreeing to you that the famine of the word is over. God desires for us to walk in a place of breakthrough. And if you don't know what's in the book, how can you walk in freedom? And that's what Linda said. 
We need to understand that Jesus has so much for us. You know, the enemy has a destiny for you as well as God. And, and, that, and when, at that point when I was listening to him, I was allowing him to dictate how I was moving forward. And that had to stop. So the, when I started to read and see that, that my mind was not in alignment, and I said to the Lord, I am not living an abundant life. I don't understand what's happening. I'm saved. I have renounced certain things. I, I, I'm applying the blood. What is my problem? And he said to me, you believe the enemy's voice. You're, his voice is louder because you have become one with his lies. You have embraced the lies because that's what's, that, that's what's locked in. That's what's there in you because you believe it. You believe that you'll never amount to anything. You believe that you'll always be stuck. You'll believe that you'll be limited. But see, that's not what the word says, does it? But how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, have issues with when God starts talking about prosperity, you look at other people, but you don't believe it for yourself. So when I worked for the airlines, I, I needed to transfer out of the, um, air, the department I was in. I was, um, you know, I, I wasn't the greatest employee at the time. And I'd call in sick from Puerto Rico, you know, on the beach, telling them I had a cold. And, you know, I, it, I, was, I just really was rebellious which wasn't good, and uh, I, needed, I needed to get out of the department. People were partying, and I was just, a, it was not good. So I knew that it would take a miracle. Now, you have to understand, I'm still pretty young in the Lord, but I grabbed hold of the word. Luke 1 says that with God, nothing shall be called impossible, amen? And I believed it, and I said, Lord, it, I, I don't have anything else to believe in. I know the devil's real, but I'm asking you to help me here. So I applied. I applied for this transfer, but I, have, I was meditating on the word, and even though everything in me was saying, no, this is ridiculous, you'll never get out of this mess, but I was holding on to the word. I said, but Lord, your word says that with you nothing shall be called impossible, and I need breakthrough. God, I said, I'm trusting you. Chuck spoke about a poverty spirit is linked with not trusting God, and I said, Lord, I'm choosing to trust you. Help me with my unbelief, help me out of this mess. There was such a tug of war, do you know what I'm talking about? There was this war going on in me. So I applied for the job and I mean, my supervisor laughed at me and she said, are you for real? Do you think you'll get it? And inside of it's like, no, but I said, yes. <laughs> I said, yes, I'm trusting God. When I got to the interview, uh, the manager who I met with said to me, why in the world would I hire you? And I said, I know. I said, but I'm not that person anymore. And I said to him, listen, if I call in sick, I'll quit. You don't even have to fire me. I said, I promise you, I will be the best employee ever. So he said to me, well, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm going to give you this job. And so the Lord broke through. Now, the thing that I want to share with you is that God doesn't you know, I didn't know where every scripture was in the Bible. I chose to believe the truth of the word. I chose to grab hold of it. That was something that I had such warfare in my mind. It wasn't easy. Let me put it to you that way. Because I know when I'm ministering to a lot of people, they're, they're not meditating on the word. The word doesn't have final say in our life. The word, that's where we have to shift. The word has to have final say in our lives because God is reversing the curses and he's causing a restoration of your fortunes to come. I was the least likely. I was in poverty. I didn't have anything going for me, but God turned my life around. And it was through deliverance of the word. It was meditation of the word. Yes, we prayed. Yes, we broke off curses. But I had to align with the word and I had to believe it. I had to say, above all, when I've done all to stand, I'm going to stand some more. Because this stinking thing that's in me, this stinking thinking that's trying to take me out, I'm going to take it out. It's not going to destroy me. But in the midst of that, I was crying out to God because then I was afraid. I didn't have this. I didn't have churches that believed. Well, still there might not be a whole lot of churches that believe, but I didn't have a whole lot that was there to encourage. But I saw, I locked myself away in the room because I had no hope. And at that time, until I got hold of the word, I'm telling you, that scripture in Luke 137 said, with God, 
all things shall be called possible. What's impossible with man, rather, is impossible, I mean, it's possible with God. And I grabbed hold of that and I held on to it because I needed a lot of miracles in my life. My family, they hated um, anything to do with Christ. And they didn't want me to be saved. And I thought, well, I don't really care any longer because what are you doing for me? I said, at least he's, you know, things are turning around in my life. And, and God started to really break through. And my, my portion here that I, I'm going to share a little bit about a slothful sphere, but my portion here is grab hold of the word. Do not allow your self-pity or the rebellion or, you know, uh, that, you know, that you think you're right or blaming others to stay here today. We have to make that shift. We cannot. We have to come with a clean slate. The Bible says in Psalms, who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? Those with clean hands and a pure heart. We have to say to the Lord, Lord, I don't care. I give up my right to be right. And I don't want, I don't want my viewpoint to, to be the thing that's going to hold me back. There's a scripture in Proverbs that says that a fool has no delight in understanding, but only in expressing their opinion. A fool has no delight in moving forward. A fool has no delight in listening. A fool has no delight in, listen, in, in absorbing what you're saying. Only in expressing and blaming and saying, yeah, but. And that's what I had to shift out of. I said, Lord, I, I don't care any longer. I will, I'm just submitting to you. I'm going to shut my mouth. Now, I said I'm going to shut my mouth, but see, that's what the Lord wants us. He wants us to stay in defeat and bondage, keep our mouth shut, and not release the word of the Lord. Today, the Lord is giving us our voice back because we're walking in the freedom of the Lord. We are not aligning with lies. I don't care how small, how big it is. We're not aligning with that lie that says, you can't decree that word. You can't shift things with your prayers. You can't change your cities. You can't change your nations. That's what the enemy wants us to believe. See, we have to clean out the cobwebs and we have to clean out the stuff that has kept us on lockdown because God is breaking the limitations off of us. Now, some of the things that the, uh, the Lord spoke to me uh, about, he said to me, one day we were in prayer and he said, everybody was getting the word and the Lord said to me, and he gave me the word slothful. And he said, many of my people are battling with slothfulness. And so I thought, what in the world is slothfulness? So I started to look it up, and the Lord started to speak to me about it. This slothful spirit is what causes you to be very indifferent. It causes you to be passive. It causes you to be asleep. It, you're dull. It, it, you're, you're, one of the definitions uh, was stupid. And uh, a hidden sense. You're not awake. And so... Uh, in the scriptures, in Matthew 25, 1 through 13, it says here, The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were uh, wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, no light of God, no anointing. You're not listening to the voice of the Lord. There's no revelation coming. But the wise took the oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom delayed, they slumbered and slept. And that word slept there means to be a sloth, to be indifferent. And at midnight a cry was heard, and the, br and the bridegroom is coming, and he said, go out to meet them. Those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. And the door was shut. And it says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Arise, watch, arise from death. That slothful spirit causes us to be in that slumbered state. And I said, well, Lord, explain to me a little more what you mean by that. And he says, well, many of, many of us who have been saved a long time now have gone through stuff where you've had disappointments, where you've had um, sickness or illness or infirmity or affliction or hope deferred, a lot of hope deferred. And the Lord said, it's almost like a thin layer of garment or something that's been placed on you that's caused you to, to, to bow over and to step back. Now you believe, you go to church, you're there all the time, 
but you're not really passionate. The zeal of the Lord has not consumed you any longer. You go through the motions. You know, the Bible says in Revelations, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, what? I'll spit you out of my mouth. And, and, and let me tell you, I had been there. We've been pastoring a long time, you know. Sheep bites. <laughs> and there's, there's stuff that happens, family issues that happens. And I thought, Lord, you've got to be kidding me. And what had happened to me, that, that fire started to go out. And the Lord said that's a passive spirit. It works with slothfulness. And it causes the passivity to overtake the people. We're going to break that off today. Then, now listen to this. In, in Matthew 25, 24 through 30, it says, Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. You, know, you remember the story, I didn't type the whole thing out, where, where uh, they were all blessed with talents. Ten, five, and then one. This is the one that didn't do anything with it. And he said, then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. And he said, look there, you have what is yours. He hid it. He, that word even means to isolate. But the Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy, slothful. And the King James, it says, you slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back with interest. So take that talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that word wicked means to press and to be harassed, a disease or blind. And slothful there means to delay, to be backward, to be late, to loathe, to hesitate. A delayed reaction is disobedience to the Lord. And many times, because things haven't happened, there's a delay. And there's a hesitancy to step out. Chuck said, the Lord quoted the scripture, when I come back to this earth, will I find faith? So this enemy, the, the, the plan of the enemy is to cause us we go through the motions, we're in church, but we need deliverance from slothfulness and a passive spirit because of hope deferred, because of situations that occurred in our life that is trying to take that fire out. The zeal of the Lord has consumed me. That's what the word says. The Lord, we need that passion. There's a scripture in 1 John uh, in the message version, 4 or 5, and it says that the conquering power that will bring the world to its knees is our faith. So therefore, if the enemy can get us in this passive state where we're not trusting the Lord, where we're not stepping out with zeal and knowing that God is going to cause me to be this overcomer. We are overcomers, but we need to walk in it. But it's a mind shift that has to take place. Are you hearing me? We have to shift. And, and it's, listen, that's that warring peace. It doesn't just happen. We have to take out our giants. We have to speak to that thing. We have to get a word of the Lord and say, I know this is the word. This is the revelation that God has given me. When I was pregnant for my, my second son, uh, the doctors, uh, I had complications with my first son, had a C-section. Second son, I wanted to go natural. And the doctor said, you can't. I thought, with God, nothing shall be called impossible. And I said, Lord, and I asked him. And he said, go for it. So the whole nine months, they, they were concerned that I was going to have an issue or rupture, blah, blah, blah. Came time to give birth. I went into labor, and they told me my son was dead. They said, he is dead, and we have to give you an emergency C-section. I said, my son is not dead. My son is going to live because God has promised me that when he gives seed, he's going to cause it to come forth. And then I told my husband to punch the guy in the face. So, well, you know, I, I, I know that wasn't right, but we have to get angry at the enemy, right? We have to get mad at the devil. We can't tell, let him take our stuff. Amen? We have to punch him in the face with the word of the Lord. And so my husband's like, Trisha, I can't punch him in the face. I said, punch him in the face. 
I said, because our baby is alive and he's not dead. So when it came time to give birth, it was like I, there was such warfare. And, I, you know, you're scared. You hear what the doctors are saying. But I said, no, the Lord told me. Now, let me tell you the strategy he gave me. I was pregnant. And for nine months, the Lord had me speak over my body, over every part of my body, and decree the word every day for nine months. See, what is that? There's a cycle. The Lord is telling us a strategy of the word. You've got to get the word back in you. You speak to that thing. You call that thing. And you say you will live and not die. You prophesy life to that thing. And so when I went, when I was in the labor room, the doctors were scrubbing to give me the section. And of course, there was a movie Sybil out at that point. <laughs> It seemed like I had multiples, but I started pushing and I'm talking and doing all this crazy stuff and I started pushing and I gave birth to my son. And for those of you who know, I had a, he had a 9.9 .9 APGAR score. The Lord says that with God, nothing shall be called impossible. There's that deliverance. My mind had to get delivered. I had to allow the spirit of the Lord. You have to understand something. I was operating in signs and wonders, but I was bound. My thought process was not awakened to the truth, the revelation of who I am. The devil's not going to determine my destiny or who I am. And that's what so many of us have done. We're letting the devil tell us who we are. When God says you are the righteousness of Christ Jesus, you are the head and not the tail. That you have a breaker anointing upon you. That you can speak to those dead dry bones and prophesy resurrection life. That's the people who we are. We cannot be passive any longer. God is breaking us out of that passivity because of situations that have caused you to pull back. God's pulling that slumbering spirit off of us. He's pulling off that slumber. He's pulling that blanket off, that, that thing that is trying to lock you down. But I got news for you. God is unlocking. He is unlocking that, that, that um, hindrance that the enemy has put you on, that's placed upon you. He's... he's you know, one of the definitions for me for curses is empowered to fail. Well, I'm not in agreement that I'm empowered to fail because I have the blood of Jesus and I have the mind of Christ. So with that, we started to really teach on it. And I had started to really press into the Lord. I said, God, you said that I am your daughter. You said that you love me with an everlasting love. I have lived nothing but defeat. I was told all my life you won't make it. But God said you will. And that's where we have to choose the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord breaks through. He's the breaker. One of the words for El Shaddai is he is the God of utter destruction. He will destroy that which is trying to take you out. Whoa. So there's a testimony that I want to share. Someone in our church that we were ministering to. And, and I had prophesied over her and, and I said, God's going to break you out of this pauper mindset. And I had no idea that her father said to her all her life that she was going to be a pauper. We were in worship service one day and I looked at her and I saw a python spirit on her. I saw this thing wrapped around her. And I didn't know she was new to the church and I didn't know where she was at with that. But... I went up to her and asked her if she would let me pray for her. Now, I called somebody over and we prayed. And I started to take authority over this python spirit. And the Lord said it was linked with poverty. And this thing tried to just it, steal her life from her. And, um, and, and I knew what the Lord was saying to me about his word. We have to know the word. We have to know how the breaker will break through. And I said to the Lord, he said, I want to break through in her life. And this spirit that's trying to take her out, it's her belief system. You know, BS, belief system. Which BS are you listening to? God wants us to believe his system, his word, his mindset. And so she was so locked in and one with the pauper mindset. We took authority over the spirit. We cast the demons out of her. We cast that python spirit out that was linked with poverty. We had to renounce the poverty mindset, so forth and so on. That very day, this is a phenomenal testimony, that very day, I had prophesied and I said, the Lord is going to give to you the inheritance you've always wanted. 
I said, because he's a covenant God. That day, her boss said to his wife, she found out the next day, he said to his wife, you know, I would really love for her to have an inheritance. I want to gift her the condominium. So now she, her little bit of her background, she uh, was a single, she never got married, child out of wedlock, and um, no inheritance. Her, the, the father of the child never supported the child. Um, she, it was rough. It was very rough for her. So, uh, so we, broke, we broke all this off of her. And now I said to her, it, it, now it's a process. I said, you're going to have to stand on the word. You're going to have to speak that thing, even though everything in you is going against it because you've been so one with that lie. And so we have to, that's why we have to renew. That metamorphosis has to take place. We have to renew our minds. We have to grab hold of it, even though everything in you, and that whisper, that devil's telling you, stop it, you're crazy, you're, you're a fanatic, you're ridiculous. You tell him to shut up. You listen to the word, you speak the word. And that was that war. That week, her, her, the boss called her and says, you will have, we are going to gift you this, um, you know, a condominium, and we want you to have an inheritance. She says, that's what was just said to me, that I'm going to have an inheritance. The following week, she got a double-digit bonus. Her stove didn't work for 10 years, started working. Her son got restored to his father. There were reconciliation. The son married a Christian girl. She started to, her life so turned around and where she lived in poverty, God brought prosperity. And so she just gave her testimony a couple of months ago where she has the title deed to her condominium. And, and I mean, God turned her life around. God is reversing our curses and he's restoring our fortunes. In the natural, there was no way this can happen. Absolutely no way. No way that even her, her employee, employer thought that he could bless her with, you know, a condominium. But God made it happen because he's reversing the curses, I'm telling you. God wants us to understand we are the head and not the tail. He wants us to live this life with joy. There's a scripture in Deuteronomy that says, it's Deuteronomy 28, and it says that um, basically curses will come upon you if you don't serve the Lord with joy and gladness. See, God wants us to understand he's covenant and he wants us to live in the blessings of the Lord. That's why, again, my portion today is meditate on the word. Joshua 1.8 says that you will meditate on the word day and night. Therein you will have good success and you will prosper. That word meditate means to, you know, regurgitate, to, re to go over and over the word. But it also means to meditate. I mean, to imagine. How do you imagine yourself? How do you see yourself? If you can see what the Lord has for you, if you get that revelation and you do it by faith. Listen, in the beginning, I didn't know anything about this. I just grabbed hold of the word. Jesus is the word anyway. So grab hold, become one with it. That's what caused the breakthrough in my life. So I want to encourage you today to, to um, uh, just, just choose today that you're going to meditate on the word. You're, I, you're not going to be too tired you're not going to make excuses. Those days are over. God is preparing us. And the Lord said he is consecrating us for what's ahead. And it's the remnant. It's the, the remnant of God that God is rising, raising up. And we can't be in this passive state. We cannot be lukewarm. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, again, like I said, he'll spit you out of his mouth. But he's saying to us, get ready. Consecrate yourself. Get that, that stuff, that stinking thinking. Get all the lies. Get all the junk that even you have been believing and, li and aligning yourself with. Get it out. Because I don't know what's ahead. He's saying, get ready. And we can't be ambushed. We have to be ready and astute and awakened in the spirit. He's calling us to be that watchman warrior people that are awake, that are ready. In, in 1 Chronicles 12, it says that these people had lion-like faces. They were able to hold a sword and, the, and another weapon in both hands. You know, they were ready. They were ready and they were armed for battle. So I want you to stand. And we're going to pray. And we're going to break off 
this slumbering spirit. We're going to break off this passivity that try to cloak you. Chuck mentioned the veil. What the enemy does is the veil is like blinders on your eyes, my eyes, that is try to hold us back from the promises and what he has for us. So just, just I'm going to just pray. Just, Lord, just say, forgive me forgive for allowing passivity, passivity. complacency, and slothfulness to overtake me. Lord, I choose to see and to hear your truth. I choose to align myself with the truth of your word. That I am strong in you. That I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I break off every word curse. I come out of agreement with every lie and I command them to fall to the ground. I repent for cursing my life, for cursing my children, for cursing my job. I repent for, for lies. And I need you to, let's just pause here a minute and ask the Lord to reveal to you what you need to repent for where you have not aligned with the truth of the word, where you have believed that you'll always be sick, you'll always be poor, you'll never get ahead, you'll always be on the outside looking in. Lord, we break off abandonment. We break off that abandonment spirit that tries to hold you back and says to you that you will be on the outside, that fatherlessness. We break that off now in Jesus' name. Lord, we are sons and daughters. We're not going to be, we are. We are sons and daughters. Lord, we take authority over that bastard spirit, that illegitimate spirit that causes curses for 10 generations and that comes into rebellion too. Lord, we just repent. Ho! Oh, and Lord, we align ourselves with you. We thank you, Lord, that we are overcomers. We have an overcoming, overcomers anointing. We thank you, Lord. We rejoice in you. Lord, we choose joy. We renounce depression. We renounce hopelessness. We renounce defeat. The Bible says that you prophesy to them dead, dry bones. That word dry there means to be ashamed, confounded, and depressed. We prophesy life, resurrection life. We decree a shift and a turnaround in your life. Now I pull that. I speak to that, that film of passivity and slothfulness. We pull it off now. We say that you will see and hear with clarity. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. Amen. Wow, wow, wow. Amen. Wow. Passivity is a huge demonic force. I want you to turn and agree with someone that you're going to see every strategy that passivity has against you. Agree with someone next to you. We have to be stewards of our finances and stewards of our time. Stewards of all of our resources. Father, we activate the authority to overthrow passivity in our life. To capture every thought that comes into us. Father, we thank you. Now let's just clap our hands and thank God for Trisha.